Well, thanks for coming, everyone, and welcome back. This is literally, I think, one of the first um, in-person sort of Florsheimer with the Comfy Chairs events we have done in several years. So I'm really glad to see folks on person. It is nonetheless hybrid, so we have uh, folks who are listening in online. Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm Professor Deborah Perlstein. I teach constitutional law and international law here at uh, Cardozo and also co-direct the Florsheimer Center for Constitutional Democracy, which is the terrific center here at Cardozo that allows us to talk about um, things that matter to constitutional democracy, uh, which seems to be much in the news of late, alas. Um, let me say a few uh, thanks to start. First, thanks to my wonderful co-directors, uh, Kate Shaw and Michael Pollack, Professor Michael Pollack. Huge thanks to Wee Young, who's our unbelievable um, administrator, um, and to Davis Villano, our student fellow, who's been uh, doing a lot of work on this event. So um, without them, this surely wouldn't be possible. Uh, so I wanted to thank them first. Um, I should also say for attorneys, um, especially those of you joining us online or not, um, who are interested in receiving CLE credit uh, for this evening, please record all attendance verification codes announced during the program. Uh, to receive CLE credits, you must uh, record all such codes on the affirmation form that if you are in person, you can receive here right outside the door. And if you are online, you will have access to online. I think that's all by way of administrative introduction. Um, I want to um, introduce this extraordinary panel of experts we've assembled for our conversation today. Why Florida copied its don't say gay bill from Hungary and what it means for democracy in the United States. Um, their bios are all available online and so I won't recapitulate them entirely here, but let me just say a, a few words roughly in alphabetical order, I think. Um, Zach Beecham, who is here, is a senior correspondent at Vox, where he covers threats to democracy, both in the United States um, and abroad. Um, and not only that, uh, has received funding awards from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis reporting for his work, particularly um, in this area. Uh, professor Michelle Rosenfeld, who is known around these parts, is university professor of law and comparative democracy, and Justice Sidney L. Robbins, professor of human rights and director of the program on global and comparative constitutional theory here. Um, among his many books uh, that he has written, he is co-author of the leading case book on comparative constitutional law, but also uh, wrote a book I was noting of late called The Identity of the Constitutional Subject, Selfhood, Citizenship, Culture, and Community, which may come up once or twice this evening. Um, Kim Shepley here on my other side is Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Sociology and International Affairs at Princeton University School of Public and International Affairs and the University of Center, University Center for Human Values. That's okay, it's all good. Um, where her work is at the intersection of international law and constitutional law um, and focuses and has focused for years on constitutional systems under stress, both here and abroad. Um, and I'll note in particular, although she's published widely as well, um, after 1989, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Professor Shepley spent a great deal of time living in uh, the former Soviet Union in Russia and also in Hungary. Um, so has emerged, has long been, and certainly has emerged in recent years as America's leading expert on Hungarian constitution and what and what has become, I should say, of Hungarian democracy um, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I'm thrilled to have her with us this evening as well. Um, and finally, Dimitro Volk over here, um, who is currently and has recently joined us as a visiting professor at uh, Cardozo here, but until earlier this year, uh, ran the Center for the Rule of Law and Religion Studies at Yaroslav Mudri, I hope I'm not butchering the name, National Law University in Ukraine, um, until obviously recent events in Ukraine. Um, he has published extensively on the rule of law in post-Soviet uh, countries, and has served, I was noting in your bio, I think maybe particularly relevant here, although he's done a lot of fascinating things as of all the panelists. Uh, he's served as an expert for multiple international institutions, including since 2019 for the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe um, on their expert panel on freedom and religion or, of religion or belief, uh, where he coordinates the working group on freedom of religion or belief and gender. Um, and I will note he is the only, only Ukrainian who has been appointed to the panel since its establishment in 1997. So um, 
fascinating set of experiences to talk with us and help us put in perspective what is now happening in the United States and why it matters that it's happening elsewhere to some extent at the same time. Um, so the reason we have comfy chairs and to keep us uh, in as much of a discussion mode and have as much of a conversation as possible, I've told them that they don't need to prepare any set speeches that what we'll do is moderator Q&A. So I'm the moderator. Uh, I get to ask them what I what I want. Uh, but let me invite all of you uh, to jump in if you have comments on what the others are saying uh, or, or comments you want to add um, uh, with additions or edits or, or whatever, uh, so we can have a conversation to the extent possible. Okay, so that's enough of me. Um, <laughs> back if I can, let me start with you and ask you to get us started. You're an American reporter, but since at least since the last four years, and maybe longer, you've spent a lot of time now writing about Hungary. So how did that happen? <laughs> what was it that first piqued your interest? And, and your writing continues, and to some extent, about Hungary and American politics has accelerated. So we're now two years post-Trump. Why is this still so newsworthy? Um, so I guess I'll start with, with my brief biographical recap and then get into the sort of substantive question. Um, so at the time that I started, I was primarily doing foreign reporting, not really working on the United States. Um, and it was the middle of the European refugee crisis. Um, and so I had been working on refugee issues in Hungary, as, as many of you may know, was an outlier in immediately opposing the repatriation or, or really I guess supporting repatriation, but really opposing the entry of any refugees into Europe, building a wall on its border. Trump promised to do it. Orban actually did it. The first of many parallels that would go on. Um, but it, it wasn't that that really got me on the track of, of what was going on with democracy in Hungary. It was, of all things, uh, reporting on anti-Semitism in Hungary, on reported rise of anti-Semitism in Hungary, um, which actually at the time was one thing that you learned from talking to Hungarians was it wasn't really seen that Orban was the main problem or the current ruling government, but the Jobbik party, which is was then an extreme right fascist party and is now tacked to the center because Orban has taken all the extreme right space. Um, and so I, I didn't learn what I expected when I was doing this reporting. I learned that things were bad, but not for the reason that I thought. What I did learn is that there was this real story going on that was even scarier, which was the, the sort of deconstruction of the Hungarian state. And this was conversations with Kim, among other people who had been on this for many years. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I kept working on this. I kept reporting using the sort of refugee and, and anti-Semitism stuff as an entry point into trying to uncover what, what was happening on the ground in Hungary and why it seemed to be totally under discussed in the United States. So in 2018, uh, I, I went there for a while, spent some time reporting on the ground and learned that what I had thought was a democracy in crisis was, was in fact a democracy that had died uh, very quietly, subtly, without a lot of fanfare or a lot of attention. Uh, that's something that the Hungarians themselves told me. They said the rest of the world didn't notice, the EU didn't even start paying attention until it was far too late. Um, and so there's this, this massive story about how a democracy can, can collapse functionally, can decline to the point where it's no longer meaningfully described as a democracy without anyone but a handful of, of ex country area experts really paying attention. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time what happens, uh, speaking candidly as a reporter, you're trying to get Americans interested in what's happening in another country. And they're just like, why it's not here? Like, why, why does this matter to me? Uh, and the thing that really worked about writing about Hungary in 2018 is that the entirety of the United States was one way or another concerned about where our democracy was heading. And so the parallels basically wrote themselves, right? Here you have a, a, a formerly center-right or even at one point just sort of centrist political party that had swung to the extreme right and had used their control over government to dismantle the protections that allowed for democracy to function at, like in, in, in a real and meaningful sense. And we can get into the nuts and bolts. I'm sure Kim, among other people on this panel, will as to how exactly democracy has been weakened in Hungary. But what, what what's driven the interest since was like trying to understand where the US is going, right? And now in 2022, I'll say this briefly, is, is the story has changed a little bit. It's not, you know, drawing out parallels for my audience about what might be similar between the United States and Hungary. It's that the American right and the Hungarian right have now become openly admirers of each other. There is a, a real 
no longer sort of sub rosa limited to a handful of, of weirdo far right um self-identified integralist catholic academics right it is now a very explicit admiration club between the leaders the leadership of the republican party from trump on down and orban leading you know sort of influencing trump and vice versa right there's there's a symbiotic relationship uh, for for mutually advantageous ideological reasons uh, primarily i would say on the hungarian side but i think because of a dearth of intellectual imagination um among the the center field of the Republican Party as to how to theorize where the party is going. And they've figured out or they've found a model that really has attracted a lot of people in the party infrastructure and in the party's intellectual world. Uh, and so when you, you know, if you watched uh, CPAC, which is the big conservative conference in the United States, Orban was was the rock star this year. His speech in Dallas was standing, you know, standing ovation. Everyone packed the room to see him. That would have been unthinkable four years ago. No one at CPAC would have even known who Viktor Orban was. Um, and so that, to me, the explicit linkages are, are the future of the story and why, especially given what's going on in American states, why we really need to pay attention to Hungary. So terrific. And let me ask you one follow-up question just to set the stage a little bit. I mean, you wrote an article earlier this year called Ron DeSantis is following a trail blazed by a Hungarian authoritarian. You meant that literally, is that? Yes, yes, I did. Um, and so this is this is also kind of a funny story. So I was trying to figure out, because it seemed like there's, you know, Hungary passed a law, I should say in 2021, uh, before the American Don't Say Gay Law, that restricted, to simplify it a little bit, it restricted freedom of speech rights for LGBT individuals, specifically um, by limiting when you can broadcast content they didn't like. So if you wanted to air, say, an episode of Will of Grace before uh, 10 o'clock on Hungarian TV, you couldn't do that anymore. You could only air anything with gay themes uh, from between 10 p.m. and I think it was 7 a.m. or something like that. And like, this, this sounds ridiculous in a certain sense, but it was it was buried and is part of in the way that things often are in Hungary, is a way of expanding the state's control over different aspects of Hungarian society using culture war stuff as a pretext to... Uh, be able to use laws and interpret them creatively to crack down on anyone who's doing anything you don't like. Then Florida in 2022 passes this don't say gay law uh, that I think you probably would be more familiar with. And there's some similarities between some of these provisions. And I'm like, does anyone in Hungary know that these two things are similar? So I, I went and I, I searched a little bit around the Hungarians that I know and found a blog on a government funded think tank uh, where one of the authors said, oh yeah, they copied that law from us. And I was like, are, are you are you kidding? Right? Like, like, how do you know that? And so it turns out, and this should illustrate some of the point that I was making earlier um, about interconnections, he didn't know that firsthand. What happened is that he was he had attended a talk by an, with an American writer, um, a guy named Rod Dreyer, who you may know. He's very, very popular on sort of the post-liberal American right, um, where he was like, basically... He, he had heard from Ron DeSantis's press secretary, uh, who earlier that day had denied even knowing about the Hungarian law to me in an email. Uh, she had told him, like one of his friends, basically, that they copied the law from Hungary. Uh, which, and so I emailed her repeatedly after that. I was like, so you told me one thing. Actually, it's the, the exact opposite of what you said. You clearly lied to me. Uh, then she didn't respond to any emails and then yelled at me on Twitter, which is, her name's Christina Pushaw, look up her Twitter account, you can see exactly what I mean. Um, and the, the point here is that it's, it's not just this abstract intellectual admiration anymore from people like Rod Dreher. It's like people in power in states like Florida, which are in, like increasingly the model for the rest of the country, right? At least in Republican controlled areas. Right, they're they're really directly looking at the text of Hungarian laws and shaping what they do based on on what's happening there. So that's a one. I have a whole pile of questions, and this is going to be the problem. The whole panel, I can tell. But so let's back up from the what the reporting has been on the ground, um, and let me ask Kim if you can to help us. Okay, so start by filling in some of the details. Orban comes to power in Hungary through democratic election, right? What is it 
um, that he does with the government, right, that turns it from what had been, I think you would say, most would say, is a democracy to, right, what was just being described, which is not a democracy at all structurally. So if you were talking to a constitutional law folks, right, what happens? Well, so first of all, Orban comes to power in 2010 um, through a free and fair election. It was not the first time he was prime minister. It's a parliamentary system. Um, he had been prime minister between 1998 and 2002 as part of a coalition government. And he was conservative during that period, but not particularly dangerous. So when the 2010 election came along, um, the Hungarian political spectrum had sort of contracted. There were two and a half parties, two and two halves of parties running in that campaign. Um, the government before had just gone bankrupt as part of the global financial crisis. The socialists on whose watch the crisis had happened were obviously not going to win. And so when that election came along in 2010, whoops, I think I'm echoing a little bit. Uh, okay, when, so I can, if you can hear me, am I still echoing? Um, yeah, okay. So when this election came along in 2010, many of us were relieved that there weren't more people voting for this neo-Nazi party, Jobbik. <laughs> which actually looked like it might, they, they won plenty. They won almost 20% of the vote, but Orban won 53% of the vote in a competition in which there was not much competition. And unfortunately, at that point, two different features of the Hungarian constitutional system intersected in a particularly bad way. So first is that Hungary had from 1990 on a very disproportionate election system. And, you know, because so whoever wins the kind of plurality of the vote, or in this case, a, a majority of the vote, gets extra seats in the parliament as a result of that. So Orban won 53% of the seats, got 53% of the vote, got 68% of the seats, part one. <laughs> part two, the constitution of Hungary, which had been rewritten in 1989-1990, had this relatively simple amendment rule. You could change anything in the constitution with a single two thirds vote of the parliament, unicameral parliament. Okay, so what happens is Orban gets 68% of the seats. He can change anything in the constitution and he does two things right away. So the first thing he does is his people amend the constitution on a party line vote to remove the clause in the constitution that says you need a four fifths vote of the parliament to write a new constitution. That was already the clue. <laughs> Some of us realized, oops, we're in for a wild ride here because you knew he was going to rewrite the whole constitution. And the second thing he did was he voted, I mean, he got his parliament to obediently amend the constitution to cut the size of the parliament in half. Now, why would you do that? The parliament was pretty big. It was almost the size of the U.S. Congress for a country that's smaller than New York City in population. Um, and so they cut the size of the parliament in half. Even some of the opposition people went along with it. And what it allowed Orban to do was to have two important advantages. One was that he could go to all of his MPs and say, half of you will not be here after the next election. If you want any chance of getting, you know, of running on this party ticket, you will vote for everything I put in front of you. And the second thing he could do was gerrymander the entire country because they had to redo all the districts. And that was the secret to what happened next. So Orban, and one reason why I'm glad to be talking about this here, Orban and his whole circle all met in law school. And they're all lawyers. And this was the most technocratic legal revolution. What you'll know if you read the press, what I mean, except for Zach, <laughs> but if you read most of what the American press has written about Orban, it's all of his culture war stuff. You know, it's and it's it's partly the he. Orban knows that if you build a statue to a raving anti-Semite, of which there are many in Hungary's past, the entire you know, liberal population of Budapest will run over and protest at the statue and not notice what's going through the parliament. So it's almost always a clue that something bad is going through the parliament if they're putting up a statue to a raving anti-Semite, okay? So, and not to diminish the risks of anti-Semitism, but just to say that after you learn that Orban launches culture war stuff, just at the moment when he's consolidating power, then you'll know that every time he does that, you should be looking at what's on the agenda of the parliament. So what Orban did was to rewrite the constitution. So by 2011, they had a draft 
that emerged out of a closet somewhere. Nobody still knows exactly who wrote the Constitution. Um, it was followed by thousands of pages of laws. I mean, there was a fire hose of laws that his parliament just obediently passed. And I would go there and interview some of the members of parliament and said, so what's in this law? And it was clear that the people who introduced the law had no idea. What Orban had done was that he'd been out of power, he'd been prime minister once before, like I said, between 2002 and 2010, what his party did or what his inner circle did was they hired lots of little law firms all over the country and parceled out different pieces of the structure that became their autocratic, you know, solid block, so to speak. They parceled out little bits of it to different law firms paid for by private money so that when they came into power, they were literally shoveling the stuff through the parliament. And what it was, was a brick by brick construction of an autocratic government. <laughs> Um, and it was disguised in a couple of ways. One was by the sheer volume of laws that were being passed. Most people could not keep up. Um, and the second was because they never did anything that was directly autocratic, very directly. <laughs> so, for example, I was just telling this uh, story before. When Orban, I guess it was in 2011, Orban created a new anti-terrorism police. Many other European countries have specialized anti-terrorism units in the police. This looked like that. It had as its first mission guarding, you know, providing bodyguards to, you know, top government officials. The law that actually set it up had nothing objectionable in it. But gradually over a couple of years, with random paragraphs inserted into random laws, this anti-terrorism police became an incredibly powerful and, you know, a very incredibly powerful police directly responsible to Orban. And um, I was the first one to kind of figure this out because I was reading this torrent of tens of thousands of pages of laws. We discovered six paragraphs in the law on reservoirs and waterworks that gave this unit unlimited intelligence, unlimited surveillance powers where all they needed was a sign off from the justice minister to put anyone under surveillance for any reason to keep the dirt they found forever. And this has been the basis of Orban's blackmailing people ever since. Okay, so, but who would read the law and waterworks and reservoirs, right? So in other words, so basically Orban was step-by-step step building this special secret police. He built a new election system that means he can never lose elections. So by the time he came up for re-election in 2014, it was already over. And he's since won three elections. He has always kept his two-thirds majority in the parliament. So he passed this constitution that came into effect in 2012, fire hose of laws. The constitution has been amended 10 times. I mean, literally, my friends who teach constitutional law in Hungary were saying, you have to wake up and read the papers to find out if the constitution has been changed since yesterday. And that's after they completely rewrote it. So what this is, is a system now in which you can't get rid of Orban by elections. I mean, just the election system has been rigged. And so has every other institution in the country, from the judiciary to the election commission, to the national bank, to the audit office, to the, you know, just every single in the ombudsman's office, the data protection commissioner. I mean, you can sort of go, and of course the public prosecutor is crucial to all of this. Every single institution in Hungary has been captured and is directly responsible, you know, responsive to Orban and his minions. Um, and in the meantime, the opposition has been squeezed. The opposition has been split. Anytime you get an opposition party that looks like it's getting its act together, <clears throat> something happens. There's some blow up in the middle, and then it will turn out there was some informant or there was, you know, the party was, was corrupted from inside. Um, there is no way anybody can win. The NGO sector has been squeezed. The media have been completely monopolized. This is a dictatorship hiding in plain sight in the middle of the European Union. And what worries me, just to come back to, to link up with what Zach was saying earlier, is that you know you see this love affair now going on between the Trump Republicans and Orban. And the question is, what exactly is that love affair about? Is it about the culture wars <clears throat> where there's an obvious you know, affinity and the don't say gay law is exactly one example, but there are a number of others where, you know, the culture war that Orban has, especially anti-immigration, 
Um, they have, you know, the new constitution protects fetuses from the moment of conception. There's, you know, the marriage is between a man and a woman. Um, all this stuff is in the constitution. So the culture war stuff looks exactly the same. But what I worry about is whether the MAGA Republicans aren't in it for the autocracy part, you know, for changing the rules so that you, the other folks can never win an election is the thing we're seeing going into a place now. And, and toward that end, and I'll end here because this is a long, long story that could be longer. What Orban has done is to realize that his success as an autocrat depends on having international allies. So actually just this week, they're setting up this new think tank in Brussels to try to influence the European Union. But they've also set up this thing called the Danube Institute in Budapest, which is this think tank for English speaking aspiring autocrats to go and learn directly from Orban's people. Dreyer's been through this um, Danube Institute is actually that, that's where I got the tip from. It was one of the it was Thomas Orban at the Danube. Oh right, exactly, it's exactly. Oh. It's run by John O'Sullivan, who was a former editor of the National Review. So there's literally now this institution that is trafficking ideas back and forth. And so my worry is that you know it's like come for the racism and stay for the autocracy, right? And and so what I'm worried about is that it's it's going to the culture wars become a distraction from. I mean, serious, but a distraction from this autocratic consolidation of power through law, which is why I'm looking out of here at a bunch of law students. You guys have got to be the front lines of resistance to this, right? Because only you are going to be able to see the ways in which laws lock down power so that it can never leave the pair of hands that wrote the laws. You know, that's the danger that's coming. So, um, Thank you. Uh, that's a lot. And I want to come back and especially talk with everyone about the relationship between the levers of power and what you were calling the culture wars. But it is actually the, because this is you know, centrally relevant to what's going on in the United States as well. But on this, let me turn to Michelle, if I can. Um, so Orban himself has used the word illiberal. Uh, to describe sort of his constitutional agenda um, in Hungary. Um, you've written in some of your work that he's engaged in what you've called a, a project of populist constitutional identity formation. So what do you mean by constitutional identity formation in this context? And, and what kind of constitutional identity is it that Orban and his party are trying to establish? Okay, if I may... Uh... Uh, start, however, reacting to what yeah, Tim's, yeah. what one uh, crucial difference. I, I don't disagree with any word she uttered. I want to supplement this by saying that one huge difference between Hungary and the United States is that to change the constitution of the United States, as the students know, you need two thirds of both houses of parliament and three quarters of the states. So right there, you have a problem. The other uh, comment, which is related to this, we had for a long time, although the Ukrainian, uh, the war uh, in Ukraine has changed that to an important extent, a parallel system of movement towards autocracy in Poland. The Kaczynski led movement in uh, the uh, right wing, uh, uh, much more Catholic and focused in Poland than in Hungary, but uh, similar. But the main difference uh, between the two countries is that in Poland, uh, the Law and Justice Party does not have the means to amend the Constitution. So they've realized, for instance, the revamping of the judiciary to get only friends of the government in uh, judicial positions. But in Poland, they've done it unconstitutionally. So there is a constant crisis because they can't change the Constitution. Uh, by the way, in the United States, to the extent that we're moving to anti-democratic uh, uh, tendencies, uh, arguably those are also largely unconstitutional. So that's one, uh, one important difference. The second important difference so far is that, and Orban has been very proud of this, is that he has said, uh, I'm not a, uh, this is not an authoritarian dictatorship. This is a democratic and liberal democracy. Why? Have you ever seen me kill or jail a journalist? No. Why not? Because all his friends bought the private press 
the uh, official press, uh, which is important to begin with. Obviously, once Orban was in power, he could put his people uh, in the state uh, outlet. But the private press, which was uh, also important in post-communist Hungary, there he managed to have his friends and his cronies uh, buy the, the, most of the outlets. So there's virtually no opposition press in Hungary. And that was done through peaceful means, through legal means, through uh, it's like uh, Elon Musk buying uh, Twitter. It's just as illegal as what, what is happening in the United States. Now, for the moment, in the United States, the press is diverse. Uh, Trump kept saying it's the enemy of the people. Uh, Orban did not need to do that because he made sure they were friends of Orban. Okay, now to your uh, question to me. Uh, I have uh, written, and I, uh, I will do a very American thing. I would never do this at a conference in Europe. I just got my book, <laughs> which was published after a four-month delay, which the press was responsible for. But I'm glad today is the first day I have it in my hand. I, and, and the reason I bring it up here, besides being shameless, is that it does deal with uh, the idea of assessing liberal democracy in times of rising populism and liberalism. So I won't go into uh, the whole thing here, but I will say that the idea of constitutional identity and the formation of a, a, a constitutional identity, I have written in another book that you mentioned, uh, that uh, just like national identity is uh, in, in a large community, national, you have to create a national identity. So it's an imaginary, it's an imagined community. What is it that makes us all American? What are the indices and the things that we share in common? Now, uh, ironically, in the United States, there is a connection between, very strong connection between national identity and constitutional identity. Uh, we talk, you know, every day uh, you can have a child tell uh, his, her parents, uh, it's not, I don't want to go to sleep now, it's my First Amendment right to be up and to continue doing whatever it is. So it's ingrained in the American national identity, but both the national and the constitutional identity have to be selective, have to reprocess, particularly the constitutional identity. How do you get most, if not all, uh, complex, modern uh, uh, constitutional democracies are pluralistic in the sense that they're different religions, different linguistic groups, different political groups, different ethnic groups. And how does this whole collection of people live together under one legal regime and a constitution? We have to find enough in common, and we do that sometimes by exalting a lot of things uh, more than uh, one would think uh, ought to be for a purpose of uh, fostering patriotism. We do it also by suppressing certain things. There are certain countries where there is very strong ethnic uh, animosity, and the Constitution prohibits parties based on ethnic origins. You cannot do that. In other countries where that is the same with respect to religion, where there are religious tensions, so you cannot have the, the party of religion a and the, in the party of religion B. So all these things are factored into a constitution. Now, very quickly, what distinguishes a liberal from a populist constitution is that the liberal constitution tries to find some narrative that is sufficiently acceptable, never works perfectly, that is sufficiently acceptable to integrate all relevant groups and all relevant individuals within the one constitutional unit. Now, populism, by definition, takes part of the people and presents that as the whole people and casts the rest of the people as the enemy. And so you have both internal and external enemies. Now, Orban has been very astute in doing this by playing on many different uh, important subjects from a Hungarian point of view. So one of it, when he went against immigration, when the whole rest of uh, the European Union was accommodating the Syrian immigrants, he reminded everybody of the Ottoman occupation of Hungary, the, uh, from I think beginning of the 16th century to late 17th century, Hungary was occupied by the Ottoman Empire. If you travel to some cities in Hungary, like the southern city of Pech, it's full of the uh, architecture of the Ottoman period. So he played 
the Christian card against the Muslims on this level, and uh, he has played the Christian card in, su in some sense to be within, at the same time, within Europe and outside of Europe. Uh, so uh, he has, uh, within Europe, he, re he reminds us that, and this is in the preamble of the new constitution, the 2012 constitution, that uh, King Stephen, Saint King Stephen of the year 1000, who was the founding monarch of Hungary, has tied together uh, all European Christianity and then, of course, Hungarian Christianity. So he's bound to this group as against other outsiders. But uh, he is against uh, what are fellow Christian countries in the European Union because they have uh, veered into this liberalism, uh, capitalist uh, uh, greed and individual pleasure. And he says, I'm the real Christian uh, family values, and this is where all the anti-gay and uh, the marriage between a ma one man and woman and uh, no gender studies, he, he uh, banned, uh, among other things, gender studies in, in Hungary. So this is how he uses Christianity. Now, my, in my analysis, and based on uh, reading many other people who know uh, him in Hungary much better than I do, uh, what is very interesting is that Orban himself has been described as basically an atheist. So he's using Christianity as a cultural weapon. This is not, Hungary is one of the least religious countries in Europe. So again, another contrast with Poland, where there is a, a, a strong tradition of uh, practicing Catholicism in Hungary. There are many religions, they're not really religious. So he's used that, and how does he exclude uh, the exclusionary side of his populism. So you have this tension with Muslims, which is not, beside the Syrian refugees, there is no great Muslim immigration in Hungary. So it's, a, it's, it's not a genuine uh, issue. And then he has this nationalism uh, and this, I'm a man of the people uh, versus the elites. And who is the worst elite, the cosmopolitan expert? So the discourse is very similar as what we heard uh, from Trump's mouth. Uh, who is the elite? It's uh, in personified in the person of George Soros, who happens to be a Hungarian Jew who survived the Holocaust, made a fortune in the United States, and he, uh, many people hate George Soros. I have met him once or twice. I know people who have worked with him. He's a difficult guy. But he's done an enormous amount of good in the following sense. He went during the communist era to try to spread his NGO and his work to basically upset uh, the communist oppression. And then uh, he uh, continued investing in liberal causes, including uh, a university, Central uh, European University, where Kim and I have been many times. And uh, that has been now expelled from Hungary. One last point, Soros is Jewish. And in 2018, I, I have taught in Budapest until 2019. Then they expelled the university where I was teaching, Central European University in 20 and 21. Uh, we were all on Zoom. But I have now returned this past uh, May to teach uh, at Central European University, but that was in downtown Vienna because it no longer can teach law students. I teach law students, LLM students, can't teach it in, in Budapest. Anyhow, to make a long story short, the uh, so the populism is to exclude the elites. And uh, in 2018, when I came to teach my course in Budapest, I saw from the airport to the center of city posters every 200 yards depicting George Soros in an angle where his nose becomes much bigger than it is in reality, holding some marionettes and say, don't be fooled by the uh, this sort of domination from cosmopolitan outside sources. So that gives you an idea that the, uh, to conclude that the populist idea, that whether populism is in the United States where Trump called, uh, this is in, in his, his populist mode, uh, called the, the journalists the enemy of the people. Uh, Democrats are un-American and will destroy the United States. So you can see how you position one part of the people against others, both inside and outside of the uh, constitutional unit.
Thank you. Um, okay, so I want to get Dimitro in the picture, and there, there are sort of two themes that we'll have to figure out. Um, the relationship between, uh, number one, wh whether Hungary is a meaningful, not only comparison, but influence in some sense on U.S. politics or other, or other uh, countries in the area. Um, and the other is the relationship between the sort of political change on the one hand, the structural change on the other hand, and this cultural agenda, which is, you know, as, as it's described in, in Hungary, uh, sort of certainly anti-immigrant, anti-Semitic, enormously anti-LGBTQ, um, and sort of um, uh, uh, identity politics, constitutional identity politics. Ukraine is also a post-Soviet, right, like Hungary, like Poland, also becomes independent of, with the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, obviously, there's an enormous amount going on now, but to what extent is it a counter model, both politically, right, in terms of the preservation, roughly speaking, of democracy, and then secondly, um, uh, in, in the sort of cultural uh, war or whatever you call it between you know, religion and gender studies and 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 so forth, um, and I want to think about that as we as we turn to talk about the United States more broadly, but also the relationship between government structures and and this sort of cultural identity case. So, Dimitro. Yeah, thank you. Well, let me start just with reaction on what Kim said about uh, Kim's call to law students to you know to oppose autocracy because this is one of pro also one of big differences between the United States and post-Soviet, post-communist regimes, because in post-communist societies, uh, legal community never or almost never uh, resists uh, autocratic regime. It's not a tool that you can use against autocratic regimes. Uh, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, they always or almost all the time they are part of this regime and they are actually beneficiaries of this regime. So yes, it it, uh, it should work here in the United States, I believe, but uh, it won't work anywhere in Eastern Europe and especially in, in post-Soviet area. Um, also, what is also interesting that uh, the Hungarian case and the Ukrainian case, they interlink in maybe in not so evident, uh, in not so evident a way, because you can't hear this on the official level, you can't hear it from the European Union officials, especially after the war in Ukraine began. But uh, on in, a, in formal level, for example, on academic conferences, the concern about um, Ukraine's membership based on Hungarian uh, the Hungarian experience is very well articulated, especially from Western Union, uh, Western European specialists, because they said that, OK, is it the plan that we will accept Ukraine and you will follow uh, the Hungarian case? So if Orban could be satisfied, could be happy because he uh, does uh, affect the whole region, especially the European Union neighborhood, because this Hungarian factor is always on the table uh, during the negotiations between uh, European Union and the European Union and uh, uh, prospective uh, prospective members. And uh, yes, this is true that Ukraine uh, Ukraine is a less, I would say, um, Caesaristic regime is no Caesaristic regime at all. Although President Zelensky is very popular now, both in Ukraine and uh, abroad, and I would say abroad is even more than in Ukraine. I think it's not still it's not a Gorbachev style when he was very very unpopular. But yes, his reputation uh, here in the United States and overseas is better than in Ukraine. Ukrainian regime is le is more democratic uh, in terms of, polit of political competition. It's not a liberal democracy, no way. But it's more competitive and it's not paternalistic. And why is it so? I think uh, first of all because Ukrainian state is much weaker and if you will the institution this institutionalized we have had at least two attempts to build such caesaristic regimes and they both failed the second president Leonid Kuchma um, failed to transfer his power to a loyal uh, to loyal successor um, because of the so-called orange revolution in 2004 and president Yanukovych his regime which is which was very close with the same actually technologies such as ideas to cut the, the number of uh, MPs and to uh, change uh, legislation in order to create some additional structures and so on uh, it was destroyed by so-called re uh, revolution of dignity um, the second answer is very diverse and 
I would say, much less ideology-driven Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian society and political elites. Um, it, there is some irony in that because Russia promotes this uh, thesis about Nazi state and Nazi, Nazi regime in, in Ukraine, but the reality is that uh, we have no nationalist parties in the parliament. Just a few uh, members of the parliament which went, which were elected very occasionally. Uh, we have no uh, strong nationalist movements, I mean, strong enough to offer some kind of national agenda to the whole Ukrainian society. And even if you think about this anti-gender component, which is a part of every uh, this liberal uh, regime in Eastern Europe, such as Poland or um, Hun Hun Hungary or Russia, of course, uh, you will see that it's not the case in Ukraine. We did have some attempts to uh, restrict abortions, to prohibit so-called uh, this LGBT propaganda among minors, to uh, cancel gender education, but they all failed. And uh, uh, the reason, the, the main reason, is that because society, the, the Ukrainian society doesn't care actually. There is no strong this ideology that uh, populist politicians can respond to within the Ukrainian society, and that's why it, sim it simply doesn't work. And the phenomenon of President Zelensky and his par uh, party, political party, uh, the servant of people, it's one more proof because there is no ideolo ideology in, of this, in this party at all. The only, uh, the only um, feature that unite all these members of the parliament is Zelensky himself. Because uh, actually it was very funny because in uh, the previous parliamentary elections, it, uh, they could even take a kind of uh, wedding, uh, a person providing wedding services with no politician experience at all, added uh, the name of President Zelensky and he won with like 30% uh, from the second place, the, the difference from the second place, which means that it was pro a protest against, you know, old elites in Kharkiv where I live. Uh, all members of the parliament lost to uh, uh, candidates supported by Zelensky or, uh, he, or or his political party. And again, if you compare, maybe not with Hungary, but with other uh, post uh, with, with post Soviet countries, we don't have, for example, such phenomenon as anti extremist uh, legislation, uh, which used by, for example, by Russia, by Central Asian countries to target. Uh, religious minorities in order to preserve some traditional religion or some traditional ideology and actually to fight both against religious minorities and uh how to say and uh, secular people because there are these funny stories when for example in central asia uh, universities do not accept documents both from women in hijab but also in, in from women in too high skirts if you know what i mean so it, it's not about religion it's about this patriarchal conservative ideology which which could uh, rest on religion but could rest also on, on something different and this i would say um, pragmatic or even cynic approach of the ukrainian society is enforced by its uh, diversity because we have this splitting line within Ukrainian society with respect to history, historical memory, political preferences, religious preferences, language, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, it seems to be very difficult to build uh, urban style uh, legal and political system uh, in, in such terms. Um, and uh, while Russia or Azerbaijan, maybe to lesser extent, or Central Asia countries work su successful in Ukraine, it simply it simply doesn't work. And, and you, if you don't have this like strong ideology in the in, in the ground of these regimes, uh, it looks like they they just kleptocracy, and it they won't be stable for like a long a long period. Uh, the third answer is that Ukraine is quite poor to create a paternalistic regime. And the situation actually in Ukraine is quite opposite because I would say that uh, all governments, they has become more and more kind of neoliberal in the sense that they try to transfer uh, as much as as many as possible social obligations to people themselves. The funniest example is that, for example, our judiciary system is funded by up to 60 percent by uh, trial fees, judiciary fees, the, the fees that you pay in order to bring your case, your case to the court. While in Europe, uh, the normal uh, level is 8 to 10 percent, which means that in Ukraine, people actually, actually fund the judiciary, the, their right to, to fair trial by themselves, at least for, uh, for 60 percent. And finally, 
also intuitively i think that of course european integration plays much uh, significant role in much more significant role in ukraine than in hungary because hungary is already uh, a member of the european union and ukraine is uh, trying to be a member of the european union which make which means that um, the influence of the eu of western government especially now when the when the war is going on is uh, is much more uh, significant and which means that you can't build an also also retarian regime and uh, get some support uh, from uh, from the western states so um all in all it's not a sort of intentional developing a different a counter model to hungary it, it just a very different social context and very different political system so that's hugely helpful um let me do two things. Number one, I have to do something administrative, which is to say that for those attorneys attending today who wish to receive New York State CLE credit for our program, please record the following code, Florida 64Z. It sounds like a license plate. To receive your CLE credits, you must report this code and any others we give on the affirmation form. Again, Florida 64Z, Florida 64Z for your MCLE credit. Okay. This actually brings us, though, to a wonderful um, sort of moment where we get to have a conversation. And 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 let me propose a, a, a hypothesis about the relationship between the sort of hyper um, populistic uh, agenda, which is uh, uh, the sort of white nationalism that that we've been describing that has worked in many of these states but not others. Um, and 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 the sort of political um attacking independent institutions removing checks on power gerrymandering elections right here in the united states there is a significant minority i think it is fair to say judging by polling results um who believe strongly in this sort of christian nationalism uh agenda the sort of anti no gender studies in universities agenda and so forth um uh, it's a significant minority in order for that faction of the U.S. population, right, which is otherwise uh, a liberal, little l liberal, um, uh, more like the U Ukrainian uh, society to prevail politically, majoritarian democracy doesn't work, uh, right? If you want to retain power, if you want to achieve the sort of social cultural goals uh, that you have and you are a shrinking minority in an otherwise democratic country your only alternative is to move away from democracy right okay so this is a hypothesis now is that part of what you're seeing in the attraction and then let me just also open the conversation to um the sort of broader um uh, the broader panel as well is that the relationship that we're perceiving uh or are these just separate and they happen to feature uh feature in common ways so so i'm struggling with this right now i'm, I'm working on a book on this topic great on exactly this topic <laughs> um on, on the nature of anti-democratic political impulses um and and so i've been reading a lot of classic historical criticisms of democracy you know across cultures and different societies um one thing that i think is basically sorry before i get into it the answer to your question is yes but right it's like yes that's true but it's a lot more subtle than than it is often made to be and so i want to get into the subtlety now um which is that you know classically when people criticize democracy, they just criticize democracy. They just say it's bad, right? Like democracy is not good. It delivers bad outcomes. It's an illegitimate form of government. It, uh, you know, depending on what era you're talking about, it steals the divine right of kings and the Catholic Church. It foments disorder. The sort of, there's some constancies throughout anti-democratic political thought across time and space. Um, specifically on, on, on the right, which is what we're talking about here, right? There's a consistent view that democracy threatens hierarchy, it threatens established social orders that work fairly well, it causes social chaos um, and destabilizes uh, you know, peaceful settlements in the way that society is operated, and it creates uh, it, it creates threats and tensions between groups, right? It, it allows, um, what's the, the best way to put this? It's, it, it destabilizes the position of groups that have previously enjoyed um, certain privileges in society, and not just like financial privileges, but but socio-political ones. 
a sense that they are represented in institutions, that it's their faces that are on state money, that it's their holidays that are celebrated, on down the list, the things that make up and constitute people's sense of what it is to live in a country that is their own. Um, but those arguments shifted over the course of time, right? And what you've seen is as the legitimacy of differing political systems suffered various different kinds of hits, the, the, the collapse of the divine right theory of monarchy, the failure of fascism, uh, the, the collapse of various different communist regimes, the ideological space for explicit non-democratic politics has shrunk to the point where very, very, very few countries, almost none, right, claim to be non-democratic, right? You have the, the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea, right? That's the actual name of the North Korean state. Um, and because we live in a world where people are seen as the source of legitimacy, um, we have, a, we have a society, a global society in a certain sense, where people and governments are not willing to rest their theory of their own support, of their own identity on anything other than some kind of, even if attenuated, democratic basis. Why does this matter for understanding what's happening here? Well, this has been true in the United States from the beginning, right? One of the things that's really interesting in comparative context is because for, for the reasons that Michelle was just describing, the American national identity is fused with our democratic constitutional identity. Even anti-Democrats in the United States in the past who represented mainstream political institutions, supporters of slavery, segregation, um, the South when it was Jim Crow South when it was functionally a one-party state. All of these people describe themselves as defenders of liberty, freedom, and democracy. That's how they understood themselves, even if, and describe themselves. I'm, I'm thinking primarily of John C. Calhoun, who was long regarded as America's greatest homegrown democratic political theorist until A, John Rawls came about, and then B, everyone realized that he was a gigantic racist and not actually that sophisticated a thinker. Um, so Calhoun and, and people like him have been making these arguments for hundreds of years in the United States, right? That uh, restricted democracy is a true democracy. Go read the National Review editorial defending, restricting the franchise from black people, right? It was written it was in 54, I think it was written. It's a very, very famous opinion piece because it's, it's baldly racist in its reasoning, but it argues that even if it's temporarily undemocratic, well, it's temporary, right? We need to, we, we need to teach black people to be democratic citizens. And then they can participate in our society and then they can be allowed to vote. But it's only legitimate. They actually say this explicitly. This is only legitimate if it's temporary. If it's an extended period of autocracy, well, that, that's not okay because that's not American, right? That's not what's allowed. And even though they're literally defending Jim Crow, it had been in place for decades at that point, it wasn't going anywhere. This is not tutelary, but that's the kind of rhetoric that was necessary to make it legitimate in American eyes. This brings us back to Orban, the United States and the Republican Party. Nobody there, right, if you look at polls, here's a better way to put it. If you poll Republicans right now, something like 70% of Republican voters think American democracy is in crisis about, and, the, and, and under threat. About 0% of those people think that they are the source of the crisis, right? It's, they think others are doing it, right? Their, their vision of what threatens democracy is not themselves. So I, I, to a certain extent, this is sincere for, for, I think, for grassroots voters. For Viktor Orban, it absolutely is not. He is driven by power primarily. He does not really believe that he's running a democratic state. He just says that because he needs to say that. Um, but this is, this is the face of anti-democratic politics today. It is anti-democratic at the elite level, sometimes explicitly, if you look at someone like uh, Blake Masters running for Senate in Arizona, sometimes not explicitly. Um, but at the grassroots level, it's it's driven by people who believe their democracy is being taken from them by nefarious forces, by George Soros. Um, and so for that reason, you need to maintain the sense of legitimacy, the, the myth that we are the true Democrats. And that's why, though they're, they're driven, many of these supporters, these people who believe democracy is being stolen from them, are driven by a sense of status quo, of loss of privilege, of, of incoming chaos from other groups gaining power. They do not explicitly believe that you need to restrict the franchise to do that. They believe you need to restrict the franchise and limit voting opportunities and change the rules to save democracy from the people who are suborning it 
or, or restricting it from within. So it's 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 yes, some of it's explicit, but no, it is not is that that sort of pat narrative of, oh, well, if we have to choose between democracy and racism, we're gonna pick racism, right? It's it's much more subtle and there's a lot more self-justification going on there, which is just I think critical to understanding how these movements succeed. A fight over what constitutional identity is. Right. Right. Uh, other reactions to that, yeah, Michelle. Yes. Uh what I what I wanted to emphasize is that picking up on the populist idea is that populism in theory is democratic. We speak in the name of the people. You mentioned the old fashioned God appoints the king uh, and sovereignty lies in the person of the king. The famous Louis XIV, the most absolute monarch said, l'état c'est moi, I am the state. Trump said something like that a couple of times too. Uh, and uh, now when you say the people, what the populists do, and Orban is very good at that, and most populists do that, is that they directly represent the people. And uh, so they are democracy by definition, but because they have an identity with the people, the key difference, and this is what I try to work through in my book, is that the idea of liberal constitutional democracy, which is in part democratic and part anti-majoritarian in part attached to the rule of law, all that in part protects fundamental rights. So it's a combination of all these things is based on the idea of pluralism. Uh, we are pluralistic in our religions, in our ideologies, in our uh, commitments. And the populist idea, the right wing populist idea is marked by the idea that the people are those who agree with me. And the charismatic leader doesn't need an intermediary because he personifies the people. So that allows for the personifier of the people to actually be a dictator. And there is actually a constitutional theorist of the highest order who said that. That was Carl Schmitt who was the constitutional theorist of Hitler. It's the main, main character in my book. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm glad. Who was, uh, a, a, by the way, a very sophisticated thinker. But the idea was that constitutional rule for him was anti-pluralistic. You had to purge the country of pluralism because that's destructive. And you said that in various ways in, in, your, in the excellent summary you just gave. And then two, once you get rid of the pluralism, there is a complete identification, direct democracy in the charismatic leader. So you transition from democracy, at least in the narrative sense, from democracy to autocracy in a very uh, easy way. Final point here, what, and, and I focus again, so I've been focusing in, for my book on this, is what is very dangerous for democracy, as we know, constitutional democracy is not so much in conceptually, obviously, uh, somebody can have an army and destroy your democracy, but conceptually is the authoritarian who sets him herself as the authoritarian, we see and we know, there are no rules, I'm the absolute ruler, or my, I'm the Ayatollah, I interpret my religion, whatever it is, there is no pretense. But what people like Orban have done, and now he's been revealed after many, many years, but at the beginning was saying, I operate within the constitutional system. I changed everything constitutionally. And then you have the alliance, which was interesting that the Florida, that's the last thing I'll say, the Florida alliance with Hungary and the law. This is an old, by now, an old process. I, I've uh, come to learn about what was, for instance, the International Council of Families, which was a Putin and right-wing American alliance interested in the courts we don't want an american court to be pro-abortion because that'll be cited to the european court of human rights we don't want a court in georgia to so there was a tremendous ngo coordination backed by governments now putin is not so well seen by many of these people but uh until the the invasion of ukraine you had you had a link at that level and a very close attention paid both outside and within government groups on finding some coherence that is anti-democratic while using democratic and constitutional language. So let me um, go to the, the question we've sort of been, been moving toward, which is how 
how meaningful, right? Because we're no longer just talking about a comparison. There is clearly, it's not just a matter of comparing Hungarian system or Ukrainian system to the United States. There is clearly this direct set of connections and very direct conversations that are going in, in both directions now. Um, but why should we worry this can meaningfully happen here? Right? We've talked about important differences already, certainly the difference in the constitutional amendment process, the difference so far, right? We have a free press, uh, roughly speaking, um, uh, and there, there are other important distinctions. Now I can think about reasons why the constitutional amendment process is less perhaps difficult here than we imagine, including you can go through state legislatures and, and there's been a remarkable attempt to sort of develop a majority of state legislatures as well. The press is a complicated story because even though our press is free, it is increasingly balkanized, right? But, but I wanna ask the experts, what, so, so seriously, I mean, right, maybe this will happen in a state, Florida, right, Arizona, a red state here and there, um, but as a matter of national constitutional democracy, right? There's no real, no real threat. Do you want to take that first? There's definitely a threat. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> let me say first of all, I mean, I, I, I thought actually both um, Zach and Michelle's discussion about what democracy looks like um, is is right, except that I think what we're seeing empirically on the ground is actually not majoritarianism run wild, but minoritarianism run wild. And this is where the law comes in, right? Because it's one thing, if you really have a majority behind you, it's very easy to win elections. And what we're seeing both in the US and what we saw in Hungary was that you can only win elections with minority support with the help of law, right? And so, when Orban was redoing his electoral laws, part of the point about this gerrymander <clears throat> was that when he was up for re-election in 2014, he won 43% of the domestic vote and 96% of the districts. That's how extreme it was. And Orban's popularity, if you just, if you, if you include, well, anyway, there's a, I can go on about what surveys look like in Hungary because the government has also created a number of survey research outfits that produce these fake polls. So you never really know um, what, and people are so reluctant to answer polls in what's now a fairly repressive regime that you don't actually know. Um, but in any event, the point is that Orban's support is about 30%. And, you know, Trump's base support is between 30 and 40%. Orban's is about in the same level. So you can't actually win elections with that level of support. What you have to do is to figure out how to how to get over a 50% threshold when you don't naturally have that support. So how do you do it? So one way you do it is you buy, you change the rules. And what we're seeing now in the US is this immense press toward um, creating, first of all, gerrymanders at state level of state legislatures, state legislatures being the ones who set the rules for federal um, elections. Um, a lot of those rules have to do with voter suppression and hide the ball on exactly, you know, who's allowed to vote <clears throat> and so on. But what we have is also a national constitutional system that is inherently minoritarian. And I don't just mean in the sense of rights for minorities, right? The Senate is massively disproportionate. <laughs> the House of Representatives has a huge gerrymander effect in it. The Electoral College means that the winner of the popular vote doesn't necessarily win. And in a country divided the way we are now, that's happened now twice out of the last six elections, right? So it's a, we already had a system before we started getting the current wave of lawmaking changes around election rules that allowed, um, allowed those who did not necessarily win majorities in elections to nonetheless win crucial um, elements of both the national and state governments. Orban did that too. And so what we now see is that minoritarian drive is becoming more extreme with some of these changes that are being made by state legislatures. And of course, you all know the Supreme Court has before it this case in which the, the so-called independent state legislature theory is on the table, which would give more control to the state legislatures, which are themselves 
the results of highly gerrymandered processes, Republicans control about two thirds of the state legislatures. Yeah, almost. And they may control more. And some of those are wildly gerrymandered. So you get these 50 50 states that have sort of 70 30 in the state legislature, like Wisconsin. And I think North Carolina has been. But anyway, so the point is what we're seeing is actually not the victory of majoritarian. I mean, if it were, it would be a different kind of democratic theory problem, right? But the combination of this very disciplined minority with very good lawyers can turn that minority into what appears to be a constant electoral winner. And that's all you need, right, to claim democratic legitimacy. And so Orban's done that. They're running these um, sort of labs now for, you know, the what's happening here, I think, is very similar to what happened in Hungary. Um, and so what's left of, you know, democracy in that context? Well, if you run elections and, you know, how to put it, there's just like we used to think that you lost your democracy when you had tanks in the streets, you know. Um, now it looks like elections are free and fair if somebody's not overtly stopping people at the polling place from voting. Okay, but if all, if all of the if all of the minoritarian into electoral majority works are being done through the legal rules, you're not going to see it on election day. You're going to see it in all of the run up to it in terms of who's allowed to stand, you know, exactly how are the elections structured. Uh, and that's, I think, what we're seeing now here. And we're seeing it in a lot of other democracies as well. But I think that's one of the big Hungarian lessons. Let me also just say one other thing about, I mean, we've been focusing, as I think, how to put it, when you get these populist leaders, everybody focuses on what, what, they're, what they stand for. But a lot of what's going on in these contexts is not so much that they stand for things that lots of people are in favor of. Um, you have to look at what the competition is, right? The question is Orban versus whom? Or Trump versus whom? <laughs> and what's happening is that these, these um, you know, aspirational autocrats don't just try to pump up their own support with, you know, these kind of legal rules that turn minorities into electoral majorities, but they also try to disable the opposition. You know, I'm not, I think, you know, Trump won in 2016 because he was the only one swimming in his lane in the Republican uh, primaries. If you remember, there were, what, 12 candidates competing for the middle, and then there was, like, the clown in the outside lane, <laughs> and he had no competition. And if the Republican Party had been strong enough, what they would have should have done, right, is to have some moderate Republican run against Trump in each of the primaries so that you could gauge the relative support of the different wings of the Republican Party, because the, the moderates would have won. They always had more votes in each of those primaries. But because the party was so weak that all of the moderates canceled each other out and Trump became the nominee. That was on the Republican side. On the Democratic side, it was Hillary's turn. She had the only competition that she had was from Bernie Sanders outside the party, who didn't get the message that the price for Hillary standing down and letting Barack Obama win without contesting the primaries more was that she would be the nominee the next time. So she didn't have real competition to show that she actually had a lot of electoral weak spots going into that election. And sure enough, the combination of those things. So when you look at like who wins elections, you can't just look at who won with a positive message. You have to look at who they're running against. And just one last thing, what Orban's been a genius at doing is engineering who his opponents are so that he can always win against a weak opponent. And he, there's a variety of ways in which he does that. But you know, you you win not just with your positive case, but by demonizing the other side, and it helps a lot if you're running against somebody who's easily de demonizable, and that's a lot of what Orban's done to win. Yeah, I think there's something important to add that that was in the question, which is about the media, right? I I have no fears of being arrested any time in my lifetime in the United States for like doing normal journalism stuff. Maybe a cop will be mad at me for dropping a protest or something, whatever. Not that, right? Like being branded an enemy of the state and thrown in prison in DC. Like, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and I don't think it's necessary. Or even like sort of the Hungarian thing where they force a sale to a buddy of a leader and then the news organization suddenly rapidly shifts in tone to be pro-government. 
right? That's I, I don't think that's in the offing in the United States. It's very, very, very it's difficult. Twitter notwithstanding. Yeah, I mean, that's not, it's not, the Twitter's a whole different weird case, right? It's one rich guy who basically just wanted to run his favorite social media platform. And we have billionaires who can do that. Um, but I, uh, I, I, what worries me about the United States and about the, the replication of the role of information in the Orban model of authoritarianism, right? Which is to convince a critical mass of people that the lies that you were telling are true, right? That That's what it does, right? That's why he needs to have such, especially in the countryside where most of his support is, um, to have basically a hegemonic control over the media. Nobody can read anything unless you're very, very earned savvy, right? Of from That's opposition friendly or even in context with reality. Um, in the United States, you don't actually need that to convince your supporters of something radical. Really what you need, and this is this is a real just general problem with the level of polarization that we have, is there's just immense amounts of disgust and hatred for the opposing political party, um, right? And there's asymmetry in how that gets manifested, right? You have just, just a much higher prevalence of conspiratorial thinking, of uh, delegitimizing beliefs on the Republican side due to the media ecosystem for complex series of reasons that are not relevant to this conversation. Um, but what you do have is a world in which there are hermetically sealed information bubbles that outside information cannot penetrate, things that, that disrupt the narrative of that. So, so long as you can maintain a core group of supporters on the basis of animosity towards your opponents, you don't actually need to own all the media or even give it to all your friends. And so that's unusual, right? The, the level of polarization in the United States right now is, a, you know, if you look at quantification measures that political scientists use, there are two parallels in post-World War II history. Uh, one of them is France in 1968, where the government, you may remember, almost fell and sort of did for a brief period of time. Yeah, for a brief period of time. Um, and then the other one is Italy during the so-called Years of Lead, which was a low-level civil war between far left and far right terrorist groups. The United States is today, right now, is the only other country post-World War II among advanced democracies or any democracy to achieve that level of polarization. And that's the environment, that level of profound social division where you don't need to control the media to ensure that your supporters believe lies. So I wanna, it, it, I wanna make sure we have time for maybe at least one question or two from the audience, if that's possible. Um, Sorry, everybody. No, 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 no just fascinating. Um, but I wanna ask one last question, which is, which is this, because what I've just heard is, well, the distinction between the, the, the US is that much different from Hungary is actually maybe not all that persuasive. We don't necessarily need constitutional amendment when we've got a Supreme Court and can accomplish a great deal without amending the constitution at all because now there's a, a new court. We don't need state run media because we've achieved a sort of sufficiently balkanized or are on the verge of achieving a sufficiently balkanized information environment that you can have the effect of state media within political factions so that you don't need to experience alternative reality. And we're well down the road on the sort of gerrymandering um, side on, on, on elections as well. So if you are a gay lawyer in Florida, what is it that you do to achieve change or uh, if not change, uh, the the preservation or what you perceive as the preservation of democratic, li little l liberal democracy. You don't have to be a gay lawyer in Florida. You could be a heterosexual lawyer in New York, but um, right, uh, same question. It's an unfair question. I'll ask your advice and then and then uh, let somebody else ask the question. Well, if I, if I can just say something about that. I mean, what's happened in the US and in Hungary, right? Is that people, is that you get populations that are also geographically divided. So if you live in Budapest in Hungary, you will feel this, but not as much as if you live in the countryside. And in the US now, what we're finding is that people are sort of moving to areas where there are other like-minded people. You know, it's a kind of ideological um, sorting. <laughs> uh, now that happens within states. So you get cities versus countryside. Um, and, but you can still keep little urban bubbles, <clears throat> even in a place like Florida, um, you know, even in Texas. I mean, if you live in Austin, it's different than living in the rest of the state. I was just weirdly in Tuscaloosa, Alabama a couple of weeks ago, which is, 
you know, a completely sort of blue little bubble in the middle of Alabama, right? So what's happening now is that it's it's the local governments that are actually the preserves of pluralism in states and countries that have become less tolerant, you know? And so, I mean, I think that, and that there too, it goes to the election rules. So one of the reasons why, for example, in the US, we've now had two occasions where the the, the largest vote getter didn't win the presidency is because Democrats only live in a few states, <laughs> you know? And so it's a, it's a real dilemma for the kind of electoral system we have, right? And so this, again, go, I, I, I keep emphasizing this because I love, you know, talking at law schools, right? That it, the legal infrastructure of democracy matters a ton in figuring out what's possible, what the outcomes are, how this kind of, you know, whether polarization produces this kind of effect or not. And I think it's partly that kind of moving sorting. Uh, and the fact that everyone wants to live in a bubble where they don't feel like they're constantly confronted by people whose rea sense of reality is very different from theirs. Um, that is partly responsible for prolonging these effects. Uh, Michelle, and then yeah. do we have time for one? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Dimitro and then Michelle, sorry. You know, I no. deferred to you. Go ahead, yeah. Well, uh, I don't know what a uh, gay lawyer in Florida should do, <laughs> and I'm definitely not going to, you know, to explain what's wrong with democracy in the United States, although I can carefully refer to Michael Sandel, who wrote you know, after Trump won the election that uh, probably the problem of Democrats that Amer the American dream doesn't work uh, properly, and if you were born poor, you, you will die poor, probably. Yes, but uh, what Eastern European can can teach us, probably can advise us, is that, uh, let me put it maybe a bit provocatively, but this kind of mission uh, of bringing democracy to the world, which was in many, to, to a great extent, American mission. Yes, it, it, the result, I would say, is very controversial because uh, at least in Eastern Europe, uh, you can't find a successful example. Maybe, maybe it was one or two exceptions, the Czech Republic and Estonia, and Estonia even less than the, the Czech Republic, but all other regimes, they uh, has nothing to do with liberal democracy. And it looks like when you bring uh, this concept, which is Western origin conflict to the non-Western world, even to so close world to, to the Western world, you will get something very different because you will find out that uh, separation of power can be used to strengthen the presidential power. You will find out that constitutional justice can be a weapon against democracy. Actually, even you will find out that independence uh, of the judiciary is a good way to uh, get some bribes and so, and so on and so forth. And this sort of catastrophic result can sort of backfire uh, against the United States, because uh, you will be pro you uh, were provided with all variety of tools uh, of destroying democracy and destroying the rule of law that can can never uh, can never exist, uh, and maybe this is the case that uh, this sort of mission bringing democracy to the to the world it somehow undermines democracy within uh, within the United States because as I said, result is, is catastrophic. Okay, very briefly, um, picking up on what uh, Kim is saying, there is a scenario whereby everything can fall the wrong way from a democracy in the United States, and it's not that far off. First of all, uh, this uh, this Orban idea that you know I win forty percent of the vote and I get sixty percent of the seats. Uh, I've read that both Pennsylvania and Ohio are structured that way. So with four, about forty percent of the vote, Republicans have more than a majority in the state legislature. So we already have not only the federal level but the state level. Uh, I just want to very quickly put a scenario in front of you. Trump wins a second, or DeSantis for this matter, wins the election. The Republicans control both houses of Congress, and Republicans have two thirds of the state legislatures. Uh, what you saw in terms of abortion laws can be uh, Pence doesn't believe in freedom from religion. Uh, it could be imposed Christianity. 
can be a real white supremacist uh, agenda. All this is quite conceivable and is not a, a just a nightmare out of nowhere. And what the 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 alliance? I mean, because it's not out of the blue. Who are the people who support the Trump-like vision? And what is very interesting, we talk about and we talk either uh, try to be neutral or we look down on, you know, the unemployed the white male who feels that one day, very soon uh, the majority of the United States will not be white and he's angry and resents everything. But there's another side to this. Trump has done very well with the Republican establishment, got him the conservative ju justices, which they love, and he reduced their taxes. So there is a, an alliance here of some core, not all of them, and uh, people like uh, the Cheney uh, show, show us that there is still resistance in some uh, deeply uh, committed Republicans, but there is an alliance between some core Republican values that were mainstream and this new movement, which is populist and uh, resentful and uh, protectionist, et cetera, et cetera, that it's not that difficult to see that it would totally undermine democracy. Now, where is the judiciary? And, and there are questions about this now. Uh, the, the, it, it held in the two, 2020 election, I would say the, the two heroes were some of those Republicans like in Georgia who did not buckle under and the judiciary. But is that going to be true in 2024, 2028? There could be a confluence of circumstances which would make us quite uneasy about that. It, it, Can I just say one really quick Yes. <laughs> so I want to get to questions too, but, but actually my worry about having the hat trick, right, of Republicans controlling all branches is that that will never end. Right, which is to say, once you have that much legal control over what the rules of the game are, you can make sure that there is never a possibility that anyone else will ever win. And that's my nightmare because that was what happened in Hungary. Col you know, again, it, the culture wars were the cover, but what was happening under the surface was that power will go into a set of hands and never leave. And so I get worried that people are too distracted I mean, the culture war stuff matters, right? Because it has victims, because it's terror. I mean, you know, we, we need to worry about that, but we can't take our eye off the ball, especially as lawyers, because when this comes, that, the, that power will be locked into a particular set of hands, it will happen because the rules of the game have been changed in a sufficiently technical way that only the lawyers will see it at first. And lawyers need to be the ones who are out there calling it out before it's too late. So if any of you have the stomach for questions, <laughs> um, let me let me take uh, questions. Yeah, yeah, Rebecca uh, in the back. Yeah. Uh, we can hear you all and I'll repeat your question for the folks online, yeah. Or you can just shout it You're out. okay, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. So, so this is a so Rebecca's question is about terminology. We've been using the word populism. We've used the word illiberalism uh, to some extent. We've talked about authoritarianism, but Rebecca says, why do why don't we call this fascism, uh, for for example? So we can talk about those 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 terms and definitions. Um, uh, but but there seems to be a, a a broader, I guess, implication of your question, which is it's important what we call it, right? So, do you want to go ahead first? Yeah. Uh, because these are distinct concepts. You can be a popular, there's left-wing populism, uh, which has nothing to do with fascism. It may have to do with communism, but it has nothing to do with fascism. Uh, and then there is authoritarianism that, ha that doesn't care about democracy or constitutionalism. Uh, so it's a combination of things. I mean, Orban spent a lot of time focusing on the constitution and, and insist that his uh, rule is democratic. Now, he's manipulated the democracy in Hungary, but all these are factors in trying to describe uh, a particular regime. When they try to subvert from within constitutional rule, it's very different than somebody saying, I'm the absolute ruler, whatever I want is happening. Now, 
we hear that Putin listens to no one and that he is the only person who decides what's going to happen uh, with Russia and in, in, in Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, this is pure, if that's the case, it's pure authoritarianism. Now, there is a constitutional court and a constitution in Russia, but it appears from what we read in the press, in the American press, that all that has now become totally insignificant. So we can't say the same thing about Trump's America part one. Uh, and so we cannot simply fudge all this together. Now, fascism can be incorporated into populism and uh, the fascism of Mussolini in Italy. We have an Italian student, so you can tell me if I'm wrong uh, in the room. Uh, it wa was at the same time populist and fascist. So these are different concepts. Sometimes they're wedded together. Sometimes they're separate from one another. Well, one thing I'll add is in, in 2018, when I wrote a very long feature about what was happening in Hungary, uh, I described it, Orban's system of government, as soft fascism. I, I actually kind of regret that phrasing now. At the time, I thought it was provocative, and I thought that it captured the way in which he viewed all elements of state power and society as ultimately subordinate to him and, and exploitable by him is very similar to the kind of corporatist ideas that were um, integral to, to classic 20th century fascism. Um, but I think it's sort of analytically precise, and it it it, it also kind of pulls our mind to trying to debate the analogies between these two, the points of analogy and disanalogy. And you can really bog down in these terminological and, and conceptual disputes in ways that, that very much distract from what's productive and what we can learn from these things. I, I Instead of sort of trying to categorize the essence of these political movements and say, this is fascist or this is not fascist, um, I've started trying to see points at which we can learn from the example of fascist movements in the past, where there are useful analogies and disanalogies between them on a case-by-case -case basis. So I think looking at the role of violence in fascist movements and the relationship between violence and elected political power is really helpful in understanding something like January 6th. I think there are elements of fascist ideology that don't map on very well, as, as Michelle was just talking about. So it just sort of, to me, it, uh, I've done it sometimes and sometimes I think it's appropriate sometimes I think it's just pointless and so I, I I use right like sort of radical right uh far right primarily because I think it's unassailably correct and it's the most adequate catch-all and populism when I mean populism is a very specific thing authoritarianism I think is is I, I I've used that very frequently but it's also kind of bloodless uh, I don't know. You asked a journalist about words, and so I'm going to talk about it for a really long time. Um, word choices are, are you know, <laughs> that's what we do. But um, there, there are times and places for these different terms. Um, and I think fascism can be appropriate and also cannot be. Can I say something really quickly about this? So, yeah. so everybody who writes about this is struggling with the categories. Here's a reason to not use any of them. <laughs> um, part of it is that this generation of autocrats knows the last generation of autocrats, right? And a lot of the words that we get like fascism or authoritarianism come at come with historical baggage, right? There's a regime type that goes with them. We will not see those regime types again because the current folks are eager to disguise themselves as Democrats, right? They will have it, they will come dressed in different clothing. They will come with slightly different rhetoric. And if you tell them, here are the six things that make you a fascist. They will stop doing two of them just to avoid the label because they read us actually. Um, when, when CPAC met in Hungary, because Victor Orban gave a speech in Texas, but CPAC went to Hungary and Orban gave this speech in which he said, here are the, like the 10 ways to reproduce my success. And one of them was spend a day every week just reading which is sort of not what you expect, right, from an autocrat. Um, and it, but, you know, Orban's really serious about this. These guys want to be, and they're all guys so far, um, these guys want to be, well, that's true, actually, Maloney, right? I have to change this. But, you know, the point is that these new leaders want to be seen as popular Democrats, right? And so labeling them then gets into the war of labels. No, I am. Yes, you are. And what I would rather do is say, Hungary is a country where you can't change the government by elections. That tells you more than the label, right? Or where 
for example, on, you know, we were, we started with Zach's going into Hungary because of Orban's dog whistling on anti-Semitism, which he does all the time. Practically speaking, what Orban does is he divides the Jewish community. So there's a kind of mainstream, you know, reform Jewish community in Hungary that hates Orban because he's rewriting history to remove all Hungarian responsibility for the Holocaust. In the meantime, there's this ultra-Orthodox Jewish community that is a total supporter of Orban's. And every time he's accused of anti-Semitism, he pulls out his Jewish council, which looks like the cast of Fiddler on the Roof, in case you want to like, know exactly who's behind him. And Orban comes out there and stands there with his, you know, with his ultra-Orthodox community, and they all say, Orban's definitely not anti-Semitic. What he's done is he's divided the Jewish community. That's the crucial thing, right? There is no longer a unified Jewish community in Hungary. There used to be, there isn't now. So it's those kinds of tactics that I would want to call attention to. Do you want to call that fascist when Orban comes out and he's so overtly, um, and, and actually, and during Orban's last election campaign, he had Netanyahu come in and campaign for him, right? This is not your traditional fascism, right? So we, I think we need different labels and I think we need to kind of stand back from the labels and look at what's happening because these guys will do whatever it will take to confound whatever labels we have. And if we spend most of our energy figuring out the labels, we won't be spending our energy undoing or trying to work out in detail actually how they're doing what they're doing. Dimitro, did you have something you wanted to add? <laughs> uh, just a, a quick uh, a quick comment that actually another threat is uh, the inflation of the term fascism or Nazism as well, because there is a temptation to call Putin a Nazi, and there are some similarities. For if you read uh, Hitler's speeches uh, right before the annexation of of uh, Bohemia, the, the part of uh, the Cheche, you will see like literally reiterations of the same words. But uh, or say that Orban is like Mussolini. But actually, in some audiences, it will result in the thought that not Orban is so bad as Mussolini, which is actually not true because he is not so bad. But it will result in the so that Mussolini is not so bad because he's like Orban. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yes.
So the the very briefly, although the important comments associated with the question, the question is what can be done in America to um, prevent the slide that we've seen in Europe, not only in Hungary, but we're seeing in Poland, we've seen to some extent in Turkey, and we've seen uh, with the election in Italy most recently uh, of, of the sort of heir to, forgive me for using the term, the, the original fascist party um, uh, in Italy. Um, and, and I want to pick up on that, and maybe this is our last sort of round, because then we, need, we really need to come to a close. You know, we're sitting at a law school, and what we're trained here to do, or what we initially trained lawyers here to do, is work through the courts. Um, are the courts where lawyers, who are, after all, at the center of this change the rules of the game project, uh, where lawyers should be focused, uh, or is there something else? And, and sort of closing comments, and, and, and then we need to conclude for the for the night. Um, yeah, if I can just say one thing about yeah. that. So what we've had um, is 40 years of the Republicans changing the rules and 40 years of the Democrats thinking any election can be won with turnout. Um, I can't tell you how often I've talked to Democratic strategists, as I guess they're called, and tried to say, you've got to play on the rules. I mean, you have to look at the rules. And until this last round, until this independent state legislature theory, which could result in state legislatures literally canceling the popular vote. Remember, the Supreme Court said in Bush v. Gore, there is no individual right to vote for president in the United States. Right. So, I mean, literally, when you look at what is federally guaranteed, in this ancient constitution, which was, shall we say, ambivalent at best about the idea of democracy. There are very few national constitutional guarantees and the Democrats have been asleep at the switch. And if you look at the Supreme Court, even before, like when people look at the Supreme Court now, this is a captured court. This was the result of 40 years of Republican effort to try to capture the court for all kinds of reasons. I mean abortion being you know one thing but it wasn't the only thing this is also a court very predisp predisposed toward executive power toward killing the administrative state <laughs> um you know and a whole and and if you look at the supreme court legacy of the last well since reagan almost every single voting rights case or election based case has just gone for the republicans no matter what the issue is that goes way before this captured court so that's the thing, you know, that's what's already happened. So the question is, what, is it, what, is the, what do the Democrats do to play catch up? I mean, they have to just get a lot less naive about how much is done by law, right? And what that means is, again, what, like what Orban did and what the Democrats need to do now, because you can copy this in reverse, right? Is you look at, at what it is that holds up the rules, right? And the, the US constitution, fortunately, is pretty empty, which is to say, it doesn't say very much. The courts mostly say what it says. So the Democrats now need a strategy of focusing on judicial appointments. They need to focus on winning state legislatures because that's where the rules for federal elections are set. Um, these are all things that the Democratic Party has no experience at even thinking about. You know, it just assumed they didn't matter. <laughs> and now it so now there's a long campaign that you have to do electorally and you know with supporters to try to take back the rules or at least try to restore you know that majorities actually win elections um which you would think would not be controversial but it's not the system we have now so it starts with consciousness raising and then it starts with lots a long hard political slog and the question is for me in the united states is whether the government at all levels is going to get so captured that that will become impossible. That's the Hungarian lesson. You can you can have these rules be so tilted that elections can no longer change your government. And I'm worried we're very close to that. You know? I, I want to add because it's so That's it, last uh, word because then we really yeah. need to let these folks. It's it, it's so easy to make this into a partisan thing where like Democrats are good if maybe sometimes not even stupid and Republicans are bad and like they're you know it, it's a little more complicated than that but. Um, it, that's it's not like exactly what I'm interested in saying right now. The more important thing is what the end goal should be, right? Like I don't think that anyone should want a permanently non-competitive system one way or the other, or one in which Democrats install themselves through reverse gerrymandering um, in, in in permanent power, 
right? Just because there's like a sort of liberal cultural affinity there, right? Uh, what what can I just say? I wasn't arguing yeah. for that. No, 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 I figured I figured <laughs> you were. The question but... is who can practically change the rules so that yeah, but like whoever the, wins a majority wins an election. Like the the end goal, I think, should be for like reverse engineering this, returning to the way the political scientists talk about democracy as an equilibrium where both sides accept the rules of the game because they believe they can both win under them and they believe that they're fair, right? And where there's a long and extended mutual sense that this will, things will continue to operate this way. And how you restore that, there are a variety of different ways to do that, right? Like one of them is dealing with discriminatory voting rules, with gerrymandering, with stuff like that. Um, others are, are ideological, right? And sort of persuading people that there is a real threat to democracy and they need to act on it. Others are institutional, reforming the political system, maybe to open up, you know, by, by changing the way that elections work. It used to be in the United States that you could have multi-member congressional districts, which would allow for greater competition and maybe even the emergence of third parties. Um, that was outlawed. Um, I forget, it was in the late 20th century. Um, you could restore that. Congress could restore it um, with a simple majority. Uh, so, and it's things like that that would move it away from the kind of extreme two-party polarization that we have right now and restore not only an expectation that both sides can win under the current rules and an equilibrium kind of rational actor model, but also a normative sense, a commitment to the idea that we need to stop breaking the rules so much because that's what we need to do to win. What um, uh, some other political scientists call a sense of mutual forbearance, that we need to take some tools for changing the system off the table. To do that, to get to that point, I think you actually have to use some tools that might seem radical. But the end goal should be that, right? Should be making the system stable again and making it so that all the actors care about respecting the rules. I, I know we could stay here and talk about this for the rest of the night, and some of us may. Um, but in the meantime, please uh, join me in thanking this extraordinary set of panelists for their Thank you all, and we'll look forward to seeing you at another Floor Chimer event soon.